Hello, this is um, Peace Fanaticism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Michael Shanklin, uh, who's a pure freedom lover. He's a founder of Statism and Slavery Facebook page, and he's a former Libertarian Party director in North Carolina, right? Correct. North Carolina, yeah. So, uh, so today we'll talk about... Um, We'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, using politics to affect change, to promote freedom. Um, is it is it futile? Is it uh, <laughs> is it beneficial? We'll get into that. And uh, and perhaps, you know, what his opinion on Rand Paul is and, uh, you know, perhaps some peaceful parenting since he's also uh, he's he's got the future of his child to look forward to. So I'm sure that's on his mind quite a bit. So <laughs> so, Michael, thanks a Definitely. lot for coming on to the show well, thanks for having me here you know Danella, i've seen your work over the years and um uh, what you put put out for for freedom and the defense that you stand for it really gives me inspiration and i think we feed off each other so that's always a good thing you've been really battling uh, lately and pushing the channel forward so i actually want to extend my gratitude and, and thank you live and i'm in public for everybody to hear because i do appreciate all your hard work thank you i appreciate it. yeah i really love the uh the voluntary virtues network that's really how I came onto the YouTube scene. I really wasn't active before then. I guess writing a little bit, but you know, doing videos is a whole lot different than you know writing articles. You reach a completely different audience, you know, <laughs> that watches videos rather than just sits down and reads an article. Um, so, yeah. uh, so, so, can you um, get get into a little bit of your history, like how you became a voluntarist and perhaps how you got into the Libertarian Party, which I guess is before. Yeah, that. sure. So, yeah, definitely. You know, I was born into a family who, uh, although somewhat political not very very little uh, politics I, I think um the the libertarian strain was always uh connected to my family not maybe not the extended generations but uh the more recent ones i think most <laughs> libertarians uh have come about you know more recently than they have in the past historically right and so uh, when i was you know raised into a family it was mostly actually a, a pro-military family and uh, a lot of them, I almost went into the military myself. And I can remember when I was younger and in high school, I, 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 I really sympathized with the social freedoms that the Democrats were offering, right? I mean, uh, treating people uh, as individuals, respecting each other. And I didn't know, I didn't take it to the depth of, of individual property rights and how everybody should have, you know, their, their property rights respected. Mm -hmm. But it was something in line with that. It was very tangible to me, uh, was some of the social freedoms, such as um, the, the war on drugs, I always thought was kind of nonsensical. You know, I thought, well, there's all these statistics that show you that, it, that you know, you go to implement this policy that you think is going to stop drug usage or whatever positive thing you think is going to come out of it. And it's only created more. It's like putting a machete uh, to a pig. It's not going to end up the best. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've always looked back on it like like that from that perspective. Uh, the, the, the other social freedoms, such as why do you need to be in my marriage? You know, uh, th there was a time in me that I, I you know, I, I had I was raised, you know, not really pro statism extreme. But most of us were, were raised in a state of society, right? I mean, most of the people around us uh, have no idea of what we're talking about, what we're going to be talking about over the next hour here as far as individual freedom, really at the level that we're talking at. And, I've, and I was just one of those other people. This is years ago, once again. And I can remember thinking, you know, I want to go and fight for freedom. I want to protect my family. I want to be a good guy. I mean, who doesn't want to be a good guy, right? And so you see the slogan, support the troops, et cetera. And you just think that, you know, it's like you're, you know, cows going to the trough. You're just, you're just following everybody else to what they think is great, right? And so uh, as I got older, I started to research more about uh, business. You know, I was, I was young and I started to go out into the marketplace. I actually started uh, really young at this grocery store. I was only like 14 and a half. It was the youngest you could work in Kansas at the time. And uh, I was in Kansas City. And right after that, I went to go work for this uh, tire shop. And when I was at the tire shop, I was under 18. And one day, uh, these inspectors came around. And they were from OSHA. A lot of uh, you, I'm sure, understand what OSHA is. They're a safety compliance type regulation type uh, government agency. And when they came around that day, I, I realized uh, real, real quickly that I wasn't supposed to be doing some of the things that I'd always been doing at that job. Not that I had failed at the job or not done them properly or successfully, et cetera. But it was just that somebody had mandated that 
I'm not allowed to do this one skill because I'm not old enough. Uh, this is what they said, which I couldn't use the lifts on the car uh, to lift up the cars. And so, because uh, I would do tire work and brakes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And once again, I was 15, 16 years old. And so they, they said, uh, you know, my boss told me, just don't touch the lift while OSHA's here and just have somebody else come get the lift for you. I was like, okay. But, it, you know, it started when I got to the, to more into the real world and actually going out and living uh, and, uh, on my own and creating my own income and revenue, I started to realize uh, more things about the world. And it, it did make me want to learn more about business. Not that I was really pro-profit or against profit at the time, but I just wanted to learn more about what the heck all this is, right? And, you know, I'd heard some of the, the Marxist lingo back in the day. And a lot of it, once again, resonated because of the social freedom sides that they s- supposedly askew. Um, but I started to really see how economic freedom was really the driving factor between the difference between a society that's prosperous and a society that's it's really an abject poverty. Everywhere that I'd look around that had what was considered more limited government or smaller government or closer to no government, uh, they had more prosperity. And America was uh, for a long time at the, at the helm, right? They were number one. And it's only as of over the last decade that they've really dropped to what? 10th or 12th in the index of economic freedom, indices of economic freedom, excuse me. And, uh, but still, you know, we're we're still one of the, technically one of the more freer places on paper. Uh, This is when you're comparing tariffs, taxes, regulations, and, uh, you know, I could go on for for other things, sanctions, et cetera, Uh, regulatory burdens on employees. So uh, I, I realized that economic freedom and social freedoms are not as divided as the political system. Like the Republicans will be all for your freedom economically uh, or, or for your gun rights, and that's just about it, right? Then they want to ban, they want to get government into marriage, they want to get government into X, Y, and Z, right? I mean, name something social freedom issue, war on drugs. Nixon, obviously, I, don't, I shouldn't have to say anything else. Uh, and on the Democrat sides, right, they want to do all the social freedom things, like let you smoke your pot. This is what they portray. I'm not saying, uh, saying either party really does these things in action, mm-hmm. but this is the way that they portray and they sell themselves, right? Because remember, the political system is just as much a salesman as anybody else, except for the fact they don't have to back themselves up with a, with a quality product. And so I started to realize that this, this thing, the, so that freedom uh, is really actually connected to the hips, the social freedoms and the economic freedoms. And so as I started to understand that more, it made me say, well, the Democrats are wrong on trying to, you know, violently monopolize and nationalize all these things to the state. You know, I don't, I don't want to live in, in, in uh, Russia. <laughs> this is this, that obviously that kind of society doesn't work. And, and every time I look at another third world country, I see societies that have usually had extreme regulations and taxation, uh, huge government burdens, even though people will say it's like corporations coming in there with their free market. I know better, right? I mean, I'm not fooled by the political left, right, uh, the mumbo jumbo. I realize that these people do not have their individual property rights. They've been abused. I actually did a, a, a paper in college. This is part of my progression. Uh, it was on the Niger, uh, Niger Delta and, and I showed how Shell, uh, although they were coming in and taking advantage of a region that was violently uh, monopolized and really politically torn, uh, one of the instances was uh, they had a, a, a huge string of pollution that was done by the Shell Corporation. And what they don't tell you about this is that, sure, Shell might have won the contract for this region, but if it wasn't them, it would have been somebody else. I can't really blame a few entrepreneurs who are like, well, there's, there's you know, resources here that we can actually make value out of for the rest of the world. I'm sorry that these people live in such a, a tyrannous society where the government's violently monopolized all the oil fields and, of course, not allowed the poor people to have the property rights. So I wrote a paper showing how uh, property rights were going to, if they strengthen the property rights of the poorest people in the region, how they wouldn't have their lands polluted because then they could actually file suits against Shell and the government because they were at this point, you know, so much fascism and, and, and socialism. They're all looking like the same thing, right? Shell was Niger and Niger was Shell in essence in these regions. So I was trying to show how property rights would help the poor people because right now they have no way to, to take this to court because they have no grounding because it's not their property, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to, if you're the, think of this, be, be in the scenario of the poor person in Niger, you come out of the Niger Delta that's all destroyed by these oil fields, and you say, well, that's my land. And what's the government going to say? Prove it, right? Well, if you, if, that's, if you have no property rights, it's just like, well, you have no claim here. Move along, right? Mm-hmm. With a society of property rights and individual, individual freedom, these people would say, 
here, you know, I have property rights and you guys damaged my property and now you owe me restitution, et cetera, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a, a perfect world, but I'm trying to say they have no standing whatsoever under a state of society and in a free society, I started to realize that that was really the only true defense. Everybody else wants to give them foreign aid and all these other nonsensical things, which only is going to strengthen the tyrannous grip, grip of, of their communist government over there, right? And so I, I knew <laughs> that economic freedom uh, was really the, the backbone and that these this divide that the left and right paradigm has tried to really cast over our eyes of of you know breaking up social freedoms and economic freedom it was a farce and it it really started to appeal to me that you know maybe none of these parties are right right maybe this whole thing's futile and i started to look into the libertarian party and I started to realize, you know, like every time I read something from the Libertarian Party, it was like, wait, that really is in line with what I believe, right? I mean, it was like, uh, get government out of marriage. I believe that. Get government out of your guns. I believe that. Get government out of your wallet. I believe that, you know, it was like perfect. You know, it was like, get government to stop shooting other people in wars. And I'm like, this is great. Get, and they were like, get uh, government out of my money. And I'm like, oh, I'm loving this because obviously most people think like only governments can produce money. Well, all they can do is produce this paper currency, which tries to replace the real money, which we all know is gold and silver. I mean, that's what has won out historically, statistically through spontaneous order, which is the right way to do it. And it, and that this, the current system is nothing more than a distortion of real money. And so somebody like me who understood how deep you know the, the, the uh, central banking policies actually go, it made perfect sense to me as I started to uh, educate myself more on uh, the bigger uh, spectrum, the bigger picture, the bird's eye view of politics. So I, you know, I still thought that there was some chance with the political party. So I jetted right into the, the Libertarian Party, obviously. I mean, it, it was like, you know, we're on the Titanic and it's sinking and the lifeboat, the only one that's going to stand it. And I know, and I can see that all the other ones have holes in them. People, they can keep rushing to those other boats, but I'm going to take my family to the one that I know doesn't have holes. And so I saw the Libertarian Party and I jumped on. And uh, quickly, you know, I really tried to get very active. And um, I became the political director and I was uh, elected onto the executive committee. And um, I became a campaign manager for a U.S. Senate candidate. His name was Dr. Mike Beitler. Very, very calm uh, gentleman, not an anarchist, uh, but a very extreme anarchist. In fact, he wrote a book called uh, Rational Individualism, which he, I think he really took parts and pieces from Ayn Rand. I think he was a, an Ayn Rand uh, you know, supporter. Um, and, you know, I, I was at this time battling in my head. I'd, I'd seen some Larkin Rose videos. I'd seen some Molyneux new videos, and, and they just made sense to me. And this is years ago, right? I mean, we're talking what? Phew. So 2009, so six, seven years ago almost. Anyway, um, so, you know, I started to, I was researching all kinds of things on anarchism. And of course, I even came across the whole ANCOM versus ANCAP thing. And, you know, it just, it blew me away how there's this like whole other intellectual world that most people, when I go to the Golden Corral down the street, have no idea about, right? It really was like, whoa, you know, like these people who are just shoveling ice cream down their throats and never pick up a, a book on philosophy have no idea of any of this stuff. And it made me only want to dig in deeper because I'm a guy who, if I'm, I'm like a hound dog, man, if I, if I, if I sniff something, I'm going to be searching for it for a couple hours unless you stop me. I'm going to go, I'll start with myself, right? So I, I started jumping into it. And this is, I think, the story with most people. It's like, well, how'd you become an anarchist? Well, I was curious right? <laughs> I think that's probably the best answer because that's, yeah. that's really how it happens to most of us. We're like, well, I want to know more. You know, I don't, I'm not okay with just knowing this basic amount of BS that I'm fed. I want to go out there and prove whether the BS is real or not. And if it's real, that's fine. But I came back and realized that most of the stuff I'd learned, you know, when I, I started looking back on public school and private school, I went to both uh, schools and, and really the public school was, it was all about the, the war, the, this war happened and this general did this. And I, I, you know, it, it never made any sense to me when I went to business school later on in college and I could look back on, on all my other schooling, I realized they did much more entrepreneurship. You had more case studies of real life things that were outside of war and bombs. Right. But that was what U S history was, was bombs and war. And I was like, Whoa, wait, why are they only talking about like all the wars from the States to the States is because they have to because that's like the victor writes the history books and they they weren't joking around right mm -hmm. um and and that's what i think a lot of people think now it's become this niche with us history uh, but when i was um 
Uh, stop me if, if you want to go somewhere else at any time. No, go ahead. But, go ahead. It's good. It's fine. Okay. Okay. So, um, I, you know, I was really uh, deep into the Libertarian Party for a while there. And as I was starting to research more of the anarchism stuff, I started to realize, you know, wow, I might actually be an anarchist. I mean, it, I, can I actually say that in the mirror and look at myself? Not crazily, right? I mean, yeah. it just sounds weird because you've been once again force fed all this BS that's chaos and you know what's Merriam Webster say about it? It's like uh it's it's an unlawful society which we know it has rules it's just ridiculous right mm. so uh, it's just it's just you know backwards I mean, everything i had learned i had to take with a grain of salt moving forward and it was kind of like having to to start life all over again but it's like you finally found the real life mm -hmm. and now you can finally have a real life right where everybody else is still stuck in that hamster wheel of 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 that that yesterday's mind right and so you know, I, I just kept wanting to run towards the treadmill, and I, I really took a, a pretty big jump into the deep end of, of uh, ANCAP. And I, I started to understand that praxeologically humans act, right? And, and it's not groups of humans that have like this collective brain per se. Not that I'm anti-collectivism, because I think voluntarism is a form of, 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 of peaceful collectivism. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's another discussion. But I realized that praxeologically individuals act. And that because individuals act, you know, we have to, we all have our own preferences and value systems that we are basing ourselves and our lives off of, and also what our interactions with others. Um, but the, because of that subjective theory of value, uh, we have to respect each other's individual. I mean, I guess we don't have to. I guess a murderer doesn't have to respect somebody else. Uh, but in, in the line of having a society that's peaceful and prosperous, we do have to. Uh, respect other people and their decisions and that extends into into property right and i really sided with the ancom you know I, I tried to really meet them halfway for for many years there until i just realized that without property um not only of, of justly acquired property but of body you have nothing right and this is where the war on drugs stems from it's it's not because it's from a lack of property rights uh, it's because the state is anti-property, not like the, the communists think where you have property uh, and the state some, supports property for the few capitalists, which you could say it kind of does on that aspect. Mm -hmm. But that for the rest of us, it doesn't. In that in essence, it, it, there, uh, that would be the correct statement because the war on drugs has to steal our property from us to fund their infringements of other people's property, right? So it's like this huge cycle of masochism that's going on inside of the state. And I started to realize without property rights, we we have no freedom without property there is no freedom uh, without the individual and i and i want to make sure i stress this you know individual property rights because it stems from the individual really so it, it's not like uh, one group of people can have property and the other group can't right this is why chain slavery and chattel slavery was obviously a complete farce once again and of course uh, why we see it under the heaviest state of systems back in the day and is there's at least system a state of systems today in some aspects you're obviously seeing a, a, a relaxation. Back in the day, you couldn't even wear a bikini on the beach in many beaches in the U.S., and you know that's kind of died off now. You used to have tickets written up for wearing too short of shorts and, and bikinis. You know that kind of nonsense is just gone now, right? And that's uh, a part of the social freedom. Sadly, a lot of the economic freedoms are still being taken, and, and people can't see the economic freedom infringements as easily as the social freedom, right? Because when the state comes out and they say uh, we're going to ban marriage. I mean, that's pretty clear cut and dry. Everybody knows that their marriage is regulated uh, on some aspect or another. They might not think that deep on it, but it's there at least somewhat subconsciously. With economics, though, it might affect only 10 people who try to go up against the regulation that's there, right? And most people never hear about that battle or that fight. So I, I, I do see the economic freedom side. And then, of course, you'll have the people in the Republican Party, and they'll pair it all day that they're for economic freedom. But... They're not, I mean, they'll still tax you. They still in debt your grandchildren. They they still will plunder overseas. They don't respect property rights at all either, right? So this whole, I'm going to cut taxes, they become really, when, when people say they become the party of no, it really is the anti whoever the Democrats have in power right now. And, and in some cases that anti that black guy, right? This is how the idiots really think. I mean, I mean, when, when you get down to the level, they're not thinking at all. <laughs> And so um, this is the kind of the world that when you wake up to that, you're just like, 
all of this is just completely bunk. It's all an infringement of other people. I, I think one of the best ways to think about this too, I started to think uh, years ago as in, well, how did the first humans live, right? It's kind of like when you're trying to decide uh, when you get older and you're trying to find a, a more healthy diet uh, and you don't know what that healthy diet is, you say, well, what did my dad do? Well, what did my great grandpa do? What did my ancestors do? What have they eaten? for all these years, maybe I should do something similar because my body's probably adapted for that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I see that a lot of people just don't ask these questions philosophically and the very few who do end up becoming the, the voluntarists around us. So yeah, you know, that's really been my, my progression. After that, I went back into the private sector and I tried to set a good example. I really try not to talk too much politics with people who have nothing, who have never talk politics before. I'll just, I, I like to friend people. I like knowing lots of people. I, I happen to know like a lot of people uh, in the internet world and outside in, in my real life every day. And, you know, I like having those uh, personal conversations with them, but I usually, there's so many people and people will find out already of what I've done and all the other work I've done. And they'll ask me questions about it anyway. So I usually have that, uh, I, I kind of have that blessing, whereas other people who are active might have to go out there and spur the discussion more. I have a lot of people coming to me and, and, and spurring the discussion with me, which actually helps. You know, it's kind of like inbound marketing versus outbound. Outbound's the old school style. I'm, I'm in sales and marketing, for those who don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the old school way of sales and marketing, really, was uh, interruption marketing, interruption sales, where you, you're going out there and you're creating an ad in the Super Bowl, which, I mean, that still works on a, a level too, right? But... Today, people block out advertisement much better than they did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it's because we're bombarded with it all the time, 100 times more than we used to be. So it's sensical that people would block it out. And so what's the, the key to do is to build up a strong resource center where people will come to you and turn to you as a, you know, a, not, I don't want to say like in a bad way, but in a, in a, as an authority figure on a subject, right? So somebody who's knowledgeable, something not, not somebody who's a tyrant, but that kind of uh, knowledgeable authority. And, and so, uh, you know, letting them come to me, I think has been a, a pretty big success. And a lot of them have listened. I, I gotta say it's, it's much easier today with the internet and like, we can have these conversations face to face right here, matter of seconds, you know, uh, people still throughout the world, a lot of them don't have this, this uh, opportunity or this ability. And so I think this has really helped getting uh, the message of freedom out there. And more people are more receptive today than they have been in the past. This is just my experience. Once again, I'm only in my earlier 30s. So it's not like I have 80 years of, of experience on the subject. I can just tell you, uh, people used to be more, especially pre-9-11, I never heard anything about third parties in general at all. It was always a Republican, Democrat, everything. Now, today, most people hate politicians. Most people uh, just have a, a strong dislike for the political system as a whole. Not that they don't believe you have to do something to change it, to fix it, et cetera. I mean, we can get into that next. Um, but, you know, that's uh, that's been my journey. Is I, and I, I jumped out of the, the Libertarian Party personally because I didn't think it was going to be an avenue towards uh, to true freedom. Some people say you have to use it as like kind of a, a segue to get to the next thing if you're ever going to get to real, you know, market anarchy, which is what I support. And, uh, you know, I can... I sympathize with people on that. I wish it was true. And, you know, I wish they would really hurry up and bring freedom to us. <laughs> I'm just joking, Libertarian Party supporters. But but the, the, the thing is, uh, we know it's kind of like money, you know, and, and maybe we can get into Bitcoin too. Uh, some people are really heavy on Bitcoin. I am not pro or anti Bitcoin. My whole thing with Bitcoin is, you can it could be almost anything out there um, that is not controllable and that has some form of scarcity like that. And, and the state, when I say by controllable, I mean you can't print off more. It's, but it is controllable in the essence that you can regulate it. And that's always been a big fear of mine. Uh, obviously, look at uh, countries that have outright banned Bitcoin. Sure, some people are going to find ways to, to get them through the internet, uh, through, you know, through the Tor dark network. And, and they're going to have those kinds of people who are doing this stuff illegally. But it really bugs me that it's uh, – it, the, the problem is – the state monopolistic controls over currency and its try an attempt to replicate money. Uh, that is really the, the the bad thing that we have to stick with. It's not that some other thing I think is going to come along and, and fix it. And I, I, I view the Libertarian Party in the same manner. I don't uh, see a system in which is controlled by the system 
opening up and freeing itself anytime soon. If uh, anybody you can tell who's in politics, especially at the top of this thing, anybody's a senator, congressman, president, anybody or even a, an assistant of them, these people are such narcissistic control freaks when you talk to them. Mm-hmm. They literally think that they have a right to control you. It's just like I think people should have the right to individual freedom. They think that they have the right to be tyrants, right? And it just blows me away. Even the people who are supposedly pro-freedom on something, right? So many people are like, you know, I sympathize with with Edward Snowden. I'm like, but you've, you're supporting the same system that's holding him down, right? Like the Demo- some of the Democrats are very sympathetic for what Edward Snowden's gone through to expose all the crimes that the uh, state officials have committed. But then they'll go out and support the same system that's tyrannizing all of us. It's just, it blows me away how people really can't disconnect themselves from the system that they've basically been incubated in, right? And so it's produced these these little chickens that are led on a, on a, on a chain. And, you know, there's just so many of them. It's almost impossible for us voluntaries to really crack through that mainstream shell. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. I, uh... Oh, oh, do you hear? Oh, yeah. You hear that? That's freedom, Bo. i have an air force base right near me oh do you oh my god okay um (laughs) but uh yeah (laughs) yeah wonderful uh wonderful history there that's it's really fascinating i um i don't i don't think i have nearly as (laughs) as uh, spectacular history um i i more grew up in a democrat you know fiercely democratic uh family and i uh I, I voted. I, I voted for Obama. I usually say that once every show in 2008, um, but uh, I know better now, so I, I completely shy away from it. Although there is a lot of libertarians that that do, you know, support voting. Uh, it's just not my style. You know, it's like it's like some people choose to to go the political route. You know, maybe to affect more change, but it's just not my style. So. Well, hey, let me let me give my two cents on voting real quick. Just get it the open because I've had lots of people ask me about this. Uh, voting itself, I do not feel that voting is an infringement on on anybody else's uh, property or freedom. I, I as long as you are supporting a candidate who is a true anarcho capitalist, right? They can fraud you in the end, yeah. and they could be the the biggest statist, you know, Stalinist douchebag in the world. But the point is. If you're really sincerely in your heart and intentionally voting for somebody who you think is going to be an anarcho-capitalist and not infringe on other people's property and freedom, th- th- that to me is not – a like you're not hurting anybody else. You're stuck. You're a slave inside of the system just like any of us are. You know, Democracy is nothing but a system that legalizes infringements through the guise of saying, okay, as long as you get enough neighbors to do it, right? And that's and anybody who has half a wit on them can understand and see right through that. It's a scam to keep a few people in control to the rest of us scurrying to try to, to limit these people's power. It's a complete joke. And of course, they're always going to, the people who are at the top of the chain are always going to have control of the chain, right? I mean, that's just how it works. So voting in essence might be futile in my opinion, but I don't think it's necessarily an infringement as long as you're voting for an ANCAP. If you're voting for anybody other than an ANCAP, in my opinion, you're you're just supporting the lesser of – it's kind of like saying – you know, imagine we're in an ANCAP world right now and somebody is like, well, if you don't vote for the guy who's going to stab you uh, seven times – uh, your neighbor seven times, and you uh, th- that means you're automatically voting for the guy who stabs you 14 times. It's like, well, no, 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 no. And not only that, how about I don't vote for any stabbings at all? Sure, I might still get st- stabbed 14 or seven times. And really, even if you vote, it's not going to change the election thing anyway. So, you know, th- th- it's just so many fallacies built up on, on, on other fallacies. It just like snowballs. But uh, as long as you're voting for an ANCAP, to me, that's not an infringement. You know, do you want to get into Rand Paul real quick? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Let, let us know your opinion on, on uh, yeah, that whole thing. Okay, right. well, and I, once again, just like I don't, yeah, I'm not anti Obama. I don't. I'm anti having rulership systems exactly. where tyrants that, are. That's exactly people, what right? I tell people. I'm not anti Obama. Not anti US. I'm anti the idea of government and the idea of a ruler. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. So, so, so uh, in the same essence, I'm not anti Rand Paul per se. I'm just anti this illusion that you're going to have some supposed guy go in there. You know, he should be really basing his his time educating people on real freedom versus going out there and saying, support me to bring somewhat semi-freedom, right? And, and I think he is playing the game. I think he knows what he's doing. 
I think he knows that anarchy is right. Um, and I think he realizes that it's nowhere close to being implemented, unfortunately. And he's just trying to play the game. Does that mean that, that the game is responsible and mature? No. If anything, I think it's a, it's a very dangerous game. He's going out there and saying, libertarian is equals some of these infringements. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, that's that's what that's all I hear. Mm-hmm. So instead of him saying, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, like once again, he, he's supposedly anti-war on drugs, even though I've seen videos of him. It, it kind of like there's actually videos, many videos of him flip-flopping. I mean, I'm not, I never supported any of the other candidates and the flip-flopping really was a, a cue to me. Hey, wait, there's something wrong with this guy if he's telling so many different people on, so, on camera so many different things, right? Mm-hmm. I saw a video of Rand where he was talking about being pro-war on drugs. I saw another video where he was saying he was anti-war on drugs. So I'm like, <laughs> what's, what's your opinion here, man? You know, yeah. It's all, all over YouTube. I think it's got like a million hits already. <laughs> but it's kind of like when people see people like this, they're not setting a sturdy, consistent example. Mm-hmm. They're wishy-washy. They're all over the place. And that's, that immediately equates to what libertarianism is. Don't you get it? The, the Coach brothers are libertarians and ANCAPs can't be libertarians because libertarians are the party. And to me, there's L, big L's and there's small L's. I happen to be a small L, so I don't play that whole, I'm going to try and you know game the system thing and try to fool people into thinking libertarianism is X, Y, and Z for a short period. Of, I am the long-term marathon runner. <laughs> Screw this this 100-meter sprint. I want the whole, I want the whole you know, 20K. So I'm like saying... Listen, we need to actually come back to first principles. We need to take this back, you know, not to uh, deontological root, to praxeology. Even if you're a consequentialist in essence or utilitarian, you can even meet me halfway because I think my arguments uh, fodder both. So I, I have always said that Rand Paul, I think he knows what's going on. And I think that if he got elected, he would cut a lot of government. Don't get me wrong. But it, the government afterwards, I think, would go right back into the hands of somebody else uh, that's not. A Republican or Democrat, or that's not a, uh, a you know even a minarchist libertarian, and it would kind of just be like a blimp in the charts. So that'd be my opinion. I don't see it being. If anything, it might even set anarcho-capitalism back because it'll take all these people who were anarcho-capitalists and who are supporting anarcho-capitalism and say, "We'll spend these four years of our lives focusing on what this one guy who's almost anarcho-capitalism can do inside the state," which I think is futile once again. So you know, it's kind of like if you don't like ISIS, well. Go and join them and yeah. change it from the inside. It's kind of like, no, that's not how it works. And to, to only compound uh, the difficulties of understanding what libertarianism is at a base, I, I think that's very damaging. It's kind of like, you know, uh, poisoning the well. And it's that's the way I view it. Yeah. Yeah. What I frequently tell people is, um, you know, there's one of my favorite quotes is, uh, if sending in a good man to reform the state is like sending in a virgin to reform the whorehouse. <laughs> One of my favorite <laughs> lines. Yeah, it's it's yeah. like, and, and like Stefan Molyneux frequently says, you know, you know, why are you going to go after the biggest mafia in the world and think you're going to change it? You know, why don't you start small? Why don't you start the the KKK, right? Change the KKK <laughs> into a that's black. Right. You can't even change them. Into you a black change brother, else. you know, or <laughs> that's right. Or the that's mafia right. into a charity, you know, it starts small. Like, why are you going to go after the big, the big monster? So, um, that's right. but you know, if people really want to try, I mean, I mean, go ahead. It's just not my rec- it's it's not my first recommendation. If somebody asks me, what should I do to you know to help bring about freedom and liberty in, in my lifetime? The first thing I wouldn't say is go join you know go to po- political you know uh, you know run for political office. I would not say that. You know, there's so right. many other things you can do first that are more effective. Well, you know, sadly, even the libertarians in the in the party that I knew, most of them weren't really pro-freedom, they would be tyrants on other people too. So it was very disheartening when I was in there Mm -hmm. to realize how many, many tyrants were even inside the Libertarian Party and would have infringed on other people's property, uh, let alone states outside of the Libertarian Party. It's just, it's, you know, it really makes you, it kills any of the optimism and uh, political activity that you were doing previous to. Um, Let's jump to some of the other uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, let's... Um, how about how about some peaceful parent? I'm curious to to hear your your opinion on on uh, peaceful parenting and and you know the unschooling, homeschooling, and you know what, what are your what are your views on that? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, children should be our slaves, and we can beat them up. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> no sarcasm. All right. No sar- <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think it stems from the fact that I think that you have a quasi homestead right over your child, in the essence of you know nobody else can come in here and tell you 
feed them celery instead of broccoli, right? And subjective theory of value does make this very hard, right? Because if you're beating your kid, um, you know, the, what's the line? Who can come in and tell you when and not to? Yeah. Uh, there are there are obviously uh, some gray areas here, but I think that the peaceful parenting uh, has some very good tenets, just like the non-aggression principle, although it can be subjectively uh, taken from various viewpoints, it does have some objective root, right? So it gives us some access to go off of. And the peaceful parenting, I think, is just an extension of that into children. Because the question is, when is capacity? And another question is, do we own our children? And although we have that quasi-homesteaded right, uh, we do not have the, the right to enslave other humans. And they are humans. And uh, yeah, I can't just t tell my get my kid to go off to a, a, a work a labor camp for 18 hours a day and he sleeps six and I'll toss him some of the beans into the dungeon. Right. I mean, the, the, my, my whole point here is that we don't own our children. Uh, we are simply a, a blip in the map of their, of their lives, trying to help them become something more responsible, more attainable to understand, hopefully once again, not to infringe on others, et cetera. Uh, but to not only uh, tell them about these things and teach them these principles, but to also set the example. And I think peaceful parenting is, is once again another consistent act inside of, of the non-aggression principle in a voluntary society in which people respect their children enough to treat them just like they would another human being. And sometimes I don't want to – some some humans treat other humans horribly. But I think on the norm, what we see is I don't I – don't, if, I, if I have a problem with somebody else, I can't just like somebody uh, parked kind of crooked – in a parking spot, right? And I want them to park straighter. <laughs> this is just an example. I, I can't walk over there and you know punch them in the face or bend them over and slap them or anything else. I mean, that would just that's a crime. That is an outright crime. Mm -hmm. But why does it change when it's with our children? Right? And do we want to teach our children that violence is truly the answer? Because we know violence uh, distorts the real answer. This it, it, it's a cover up of of real teaching and real learning. So uh, we know it, it, it only hampers a child's learning abilities. Uh, and and it's, I think one of the things that's really important to take away from this is uh, that peaceful parenting even goes as far as saying not to spank your children. And and I agree with this. I don't spank my son. Of course, uh, spanking at two years old, he, he wouldn't even really understand what the heck's going on, which is sad because some children are actually spanked at one year old. And it's like, what are you doing? The kid has no idea from, from cause and effect. They don't, they can't pick that up until at least 20 months plus. Right. So, um, not only are the parents just completely short sighted on what's realistic as far as learning from a child perspective, but on the other hand is, do we have, is, is, is beating up this kid or hitting them and physically impairing them? Is that really the best way? to treat uh, or to train and show other people how to uh, interact with other humans. I think if anything, that it is true that people who are spanked go off to, uh, are statistically uh, more incarcerated, right? They have higher incarceration rates. Uh, they have more domestic violence. They have more uh, abuse, fights, et cetera, more problems, uh, more uh, learning disabilities. I mean, these things are documented too, that the, the more physical abuse, the worse it gets, right? So there is, uh, even a proportional scale to it as well, right? I'm not saying it's exponentially uh, there, but there is obviously a positive correlation. And I think it's important for us to realize that uh, because we don't own our kids, uh, we should try to treat them just like we would another human and to give them the same respect. You know, that's kind of my short answer. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Um, when I, I had my, uh, when my wife had her, her child in 2010, I think the next year I discovered um, Stefan Molyneux's uh, video on uh, spanking. And that was the first Stefan Molyneux video I saw. And then that's when it kind of opened oh, wow. the floodgates of everything else that he was talking about. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it really opened my eyes because I remember me and my wife, before we had kids, we were saying, you know, we're going to spank our kids, right? Yeah, I mean, if he's bad, he's probably, you know, a little smack. It was, I mean, that's because that's what you grow up in. because you want to be good parents yeah that's you think you that's the best good thing parenting. that's what right. you experience so you think you know how can my parents be evil or something or bad or you know anything right. they did was good you know so right exactly uh you have good yeah. intentions. And, 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 and yeah i think you know the good intention thing is really a bad cover-up but it also does have some legitimacy obviously if, if you know parents who spank usually are trying to do the right thing they're just doing the wrong thing 
Yeah. You know, that, that's all it is. I mean, um, most of them don't have four year psychology degrees or child development degrees. I mean, like, let's be real. You know, they're just most of them don't even have any degrees or and I'm not saying degrees are even important. What, I, what I'm saying is they don't even research any of this stuff. OK, that's what I'm trying to get at here, because, uh, you know, the, the whole degree thing is a whole nother field. But my, my whole point is most most parents simply. Uh, when you you don't have to to pass a litmus test to have children, right? Sadly, I guess you do. That the litmus test is that you have uh, a seed or an egg, and that you meet somebody else with a seed or an egg, right? I mean, and then you do. You're not impotent. That's pretty much the base one. So outside of that, there's not much else to really hold people's feet to the fire, right? Yeah. So you know, it's kind of like you don't have to be smart to have kids. So right. how, how do we? We can't expect them all to know all these things about, uh, you know statistics as far as spanking and, and the rest of that goes because there are is, I mean, any child uh, well almost all uh, people now in child development will tell you spanking is not a good thing it's detrimental to the child's uh, uh, you know cognitive abilities etc so uh, I think science has really went, went out on this issue uh, through case studies scientific evidence you know scientific method and um, spanking overall consequentialistly and utilitarian wise uh, is harmful and deontologically it's uh, in my opinion uh, you know going above and beyond true discipline and is an infringement on the non-aggression principle but once again I'm not going to go around and and tackle other parents who spank but I will definitely uh, I will definitely do what I can to voice my opinion and, and let them understand that I disdain Yes, exactly. Uh, well, I don't want to keep you too long, but I just want to say one more thing before we sign off is uh, one interesting argument uh, I get is, uh, you know, but you have to respect your elders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I find that funny. And when somebody told me that, it was a family member, and when they said that to me, I'm like, so does that mean I should respect Charles Manson because he's older than me? <laughs> I'm like, no. Well, define respect. That's the thing they never define. Define respect means do whatever I say. That's what they. That's what it equates. And and first of all, if I'm going to, I, I try to respect everybody, right? Like not infringing on other people. I think we should respect everybody, not just elders. So it's like they don't, they're not defining terms. They're not being objective. It, it's it's just another term to to try to get control. Uh, over another person, and uh, yeah, I, I see, I see right through that excuse. And uh, once again, it's because they were fed that line, and they thought, well, maybe that's right, and so they did it, and that's what they were raised into. So you know, it's hard once again when you're you're fighting this uphill social norm battle, mm -hmm. and most of the people just are still stuck in yesteryear. Oh, I get that all the time too. You know, uh, when I'm when my son does something, you know, wrong or hit somebody or stuff, or you know, and. And I'm and I sit him down and I want to talk to him and say why you know I'm explaining things to him and then I get from family members, look at him he's just trying to control you you have to be the one in control he's trying to control I'm like no it's not about control that's the whole problem that's what everybody seems to think you know I'm not trying to control him <laughs> and I don't think yeah. he's trying to control me it's like it's like kids people think kids are like these little deceived manipulators you know it's trying to you trying to, you know, do something with my brain or something. Yeah, well, technically, technically, we're all a little bit trying to get our way. You know, once again, manipulation is another one of those terms. It's kind of like greed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like so subjective. It's like, well, what do you, what's, how do you quantify it? True. Quanti True. How, how many utils do I have to have until I'm, <laughs> what was the term you were just using? Uh, manip or uh, deceive manip or manip manipulate, manipulate. Yeah. yeah. How, how many utils of manipulation do I have? Right. I mean, you can't quantify it. It's just it's 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 something that's intangible, and that's the reason they use it. Once again, it's just it's an emotional bias. I think it's searching for confirmation bias and whatever argument they say is right. Right. I mean, that's just the way it goes. So. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, awesome, uh, Michael. Thank you very much for the conversation. Uh, can can so, you can you let everybody know where they can find your work or your videos? They want yeah. To well. Right now, right now, uh, and I know I got a lot of people upset about this, but I have made my videos private. I mean, sure, you can find lots of them. People have reposted them all over the internet, but my my personal channels right now, while I'm in the private sector and trying to scrunch these million dollar deals, I I really have to be careful um, with you know who sees me where. Mm. So um, this is why I haven't even taken an interview. You're the first one. I told Cheryl I was going to do one. And she was like seriously you've been turning them down I was like yeah because i like this guy first of all oh, second hey. of all i want to support his channel well, i do i i love peaceful anarchism and I, I wanted to see it do well and to grow and uh you know voluntary virtues network you you've been a supporter of that so i had to swing back the the favor the other way and uh, you know really in essence it's just kind of like uh, i i don't have a, a channel right now 
uh, to point people at, but I would tell you guys to go to the Voluntary Virtues Network channel, support all the other great uh, show hosts that we have over there on that network. And uh, I do appreciate your guys' support and spreading the video rounds and helping us get uh, uh, the show and the channel up and going. And if you actually want any of you out there, think you you know want to take a stab at it, you know, one time before I met Mr. Cuellar here, uh, he wasn't doing videos and now he is and he's doing really good at them. And I'm so glad that I, I talked to him about doing this stuff because I, I think I set off a nice big fireworks right here and the explosions <laughs> just at the beginning of this long cosmic firework explosion. So I hope I can crea create uh, more of these explosions down the road. If you want to be a part of this explosion, you know, contact me over on Facebook, Mike Shanklin, and we'll definitely work something out. Awesome. Yes, uh, I'm very delighted to be a part of the Voluntary Virtues Network family. It's been a wonderful experience for me. So thank you very much, Michael, for that and for the conversation. Uh, so this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the ConsciousResistance.com and the SeedsOfLiberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys.